We have been looking over all the questions that have been handled in. There are over perhaps 100 and more or less. And I'm afraid we cannot answer all those questions. But we could if we all stayed here for a couple of months. <laughs> but I don't think that would be possible. When one asks a question, the, it, in that is implied some, we, someone is going to answer the question. The meaning of that word question means to seek. So together we are going to seek the answer. Not that I am the speaker is going to answer the question, but together we are going to seek, find, discover the right answer. So please, this is not a Delphic oracle. Together we are going to find out the meaning and the significance not only of the question but also together seek the answer. A lot of questions have been asked which are rather, which could be answered if one thought it over carefully for oneself. And other questions with regard to yoga, should one do it, should one not do it? What, why are you vegetarian? Why don't you grow your hair longer? <laughs> <laughs> and all that kind of So of all those questions that have been handed in, the speaker has carefully chosen what seems to be representative of all the questions. So I hope you will not mind if, you are, if, if your particular question is not answered. Perhaps it will be answered when we go through all the questions that have been, that we have typed it out. Is that all right? You have spoken so much against organizations. So why do you have schools and foundations? And why do you speak? Did I answer this question? Yes? Then I think a group of us saw the necessity of having a school. School, the meaning of that word school means leisure. Leisure in which to learn. And a place where Students and the teachers can fly. And a place where a future generation can be prepared. Because schools are meant for that. Not just merely to turn out human beings to mechanical, technological instruments merely jobs and careers and so on, which is necessary, but also flower as human beings without fear, without confusion, with great integrity. And 
to bring about such a good human being, I'm using the word good in its proper sense, not in the respectable sense. Good in the sense a whole human being, not fragmented, not broken up, not confused. And it is very difficult to find teachers who are also inclined that way. And as you know, as one is aware, the teachers are the lowest paid, without the least respect by the society, and so on. So we are trying both in India, where there are nearly six schools, in California and Canada, one here, to see that there are really a centers of understanding, of comprehension of life, not books only. And uh, we thought it is such a place is necessary. And that's why we have these schools. They may not always succeed, but perhaps one or two after ten years might come out of it as total human beings. And the foundations in California, in America, in India, here, in other places, Canada, are mere exist not to as centers of enlightenment and all that business, but merely to publish books, to organize these gatherings, to help the schools, and so on. And nobody is making any profit out of it. Right? And why do I speak? This has been often asked. Why do you waste your energy after 60 years and nobody seems to change? Why do you bother about it? Is it a form of self-fulfillment? You understand my question? Is it a form of where you get energy talking about things, so you depend on the audience. We've been all through all that several times. First of all, I don't depend on you. As, an, as a group who come to listen to the speaker, I've been silent, the speaker has been silent, so I can uh, you can be rest assured that the speaker is not exploiting you, is not attached to a particular group or see necessary for him to have a gathering. But then why do you speak? What is your motive? Right? There is no motive. I think when one sees something beautiful, true, one wants to tell people about it, out of affection, out of compassion, out of love. And if those who are not interested in it, it's all right. Those who are interested, perhaps, can gather together. And it's also, can you ask the flower why it grows? Why it has perfume? And it's for the same reason the speaker talks. Is it always wrong or misguided to walk with an enlightened man and be a sannyasi? <laughs> Is it always wrong or misguided 
to work with an enlightened man and be a sannyasi. Sannyasi. It is sannyasa, sannyasan is a Sanskrit word. It's an old, very old tradition in India where the monks who take this vow, they really renounce the world. Outwardly. They only stay in one place, in stay one night in each place. They beg. They are celibate. They have nothing except what they they, they have one or two claws. You understand? The modern sannyasin. Is none of those. You understand what I'm saying? He's been called a sannyasin by somebody in India, and they think it's marvelous. Put on a robe, yellow robe or pink robe or whatever the robe put on, and beads, and they think they are sannyasis. It's not. They are not. It's a misguided and not ethical to call them sannyasis. And to work, to be all, it, is it always wrong and misguided to work with an enlightened man? How do you know who is enlightened? How do you know? Would you kindly ask? How do you know? By his looks, because people call him enlightened, or he himself calls himself that he is enlightened. If he calls himself enlightened, then you may be assured that he is not enlightened. <laughs> there are a great many gurus who are doing this, playing this game, calling themselves lords great, giving themselves titles and doing a lot of mischief. And before you find out who is enlightened, why don't you find out what is enlightenment? You understand my question? I may consider you as enlightened. What is my criterion? which makes me judge that you are enlightened. Is it because of some tricks? Great many people come round me, put garlands round me, or enlightenment is something that cannot possibly be talked about. The man who says, I know, does not know. Right? Please be serious about this, because there are lots of people are doing this in India, mostly Americans and Europeans. Who gathered there, and uh, you know, go on the circus. So, shouldn't we doubt, question these people? And if you question them, will they answer you? Or they have put themselves up on a platform? you know, on a level which forbids you to question them. So to work with an enlightened human being is totally unimportant. What is important is to work upon oneself, not with somebody. Right? We are seeking this together. 
I'm not telling, please, I'm not advising, counselling, etc., etc. But together, to find out what is the truth about all these matters. Because truth is something that has no power. Right? There is no way to it. Nobody can point it out to you. It is not something fixed and you can go towards it in a, by a system, by a meditation, by a method and so on. A living thing can, has no power to it. And if one is seriously inclined to find out what is truth, one has to lay the foundation first to have great sense, great sensitivity, to be without fear completely. To have great integrity and to be free from all knowledge, psychological knowledge, and therefore the ending of suffering. From that arises love and compassion. If that is not there as the well-laid, deep foundation, one is merely caught in illusions, illusions that man has fabricated, thought has invented, visions that have the projection of one's own conditioning. So all that has to be put aside to find that which is beyond time. You say that fundamentally my mind works in exactly the same way as everyone else. Why does this make me responsible for the whole world? You say that fundamentally my mind works in exactly the same way as everyone else. Why does this make me feel responsible for the whole world? I'm afraid I did not say that. I said, the speaker said, that wherever you go throughout the world, human beings suffer. They are in conflict, they are in anxiety, uncertainty, both psychologically and phys physically there is mental security, there is fear, there is loneliness, despair, depression. This is the common lot of all human beings, whether they live in China, Japan, India, or here, or in America, or Russia. Everybody goes through this. This is their life. And as a human being, you are the whole world, psychologically. You are not separate from the man who is suffering, anxious, lonely in India or in America. So you are the world and the world is you. This is a fact which very few people realise, not a, a fa an intellectual fact a philosophical concept, an ideal, something to be longed for, 
but it's a, it's a fact as you are heading. And when one realised that, that profoundly inside, not intellectually, verbally or idea, ideologically, then the question arises, what is my responsibility? We are asking each other this question, please. What is, when you realise that, not verbal, but, you know, in your blood, that you are no longer an individual, which is a great shock for most people. They don't accept that. We think our minds, our problems, our anxieties is ours, mine, not yours. And when you when sees the truth of this matter, then what is our responsibility? Not only one has a family, wife and children, one has to be responsible for those, naturally. But is but what is your responsibility globally? You understand my question? for the whole of mankind, because you are the mankind. You have your illusions, your images of God, your images of heaven and so on, so on. You have your rituals, you are, you know, the whole business, exactly like the rest of the world, only in different names. They don't call themselves Christians, they call themselves Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists. But the pattern is the same. Right? So when we realise that, what is our responsibility? That is, how do you respond to the challenge? You understand my question? How do you answer? What's your reaction when you feel that you are humanity? This is the challenge, you understand? How do you meet a challenge? If you meet it from your old individual conditioning, your response will naturally be totally inadequate. Right? It will be fragmentary, it will be rather shoddy. So you, one has to find out what is our response to this great challenge. Does your mind meet it greatly, or with your fears, with your anxieties, you follow? The little concern about yourself. So the responsibility depends, if I may point out, upon the response to the challenge. If one said, this is your responsibility, join, not League of Nations, but some other nations, form a group, do this and do that, that is not adequate challenge. How do you respond to this challenge psychologically, inward? Is it just a flutter, a romantic appeal, or something profound that will transform your whole way of looking at life? 
then you are no longer British, American, French, you follow? Will you give up all that? Or merely play with the idea that it's a marvellous utopian concept? Right? So, the responsibility to this challenge depends on you. Whether your mind is capable of meeting this enormous human wholeness, this human current. When I listen to you, there is an urgency to change. When I return home, it fades. What am I to do? <laughs> when I listen to you, there is an urgency to change. When I return home, it fades. What am I to do? <coughs> well, what are you to do? Is the urgency of to change influenced or pointed out by the speaker, and therefore you, while you are here, you are, you are driven into a corner, and when you leave. Naturally, the you are no longer in the corner. That means you are being influenced, challenged, driven, persuaded. And when all that is gone, you are where you were. Right? Now, what is one to do? Please think it out, let's think it out, let's seek it out, the right answer to this. What is one to do? I come to this gathering from a distant place. It's a lovely day. I put up a tent and I'm really interested. I've read not only what the speaker has said and written, but I've read a great deal. I've followed the Christian concepts the Buddhist investigation, the Hindu mythology. I have also done different forms of meditation, the TM, the Tibetan, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Zen. But I am dissatisfied with all those. And I come here, and I listen. And am I prepared to listen completely? I cannot listen completely if I bring all my knowledge here. I cannot listen or learn or comprehend completely if I belong to some sect, if I am attached to one particular concept and 
I want to add what has been said here to that also. Right? I, I must come, if I'm serious, with a free mind, with a mind that says, let's find out, for God's sake. Not, I want to add what you are saying to what already I know. You follow all this? So what is one's attitude about all this? The speaker has been saying constantly, freedom is absolutely necessary. Psychological freedom first, not physical freedom that you have in these countries, except in the totalitarian countries. There is, so without inward freedom, which can only come about when one understands one conditioning, the conditioning which is both cultural, religious, economic, social, physical, And can one be free of that? Free primarily the psychological conditioning. One fact which is that you are no longer an individual. The very word individual means undivided, not broken up. And we are, and that we are not individuals. So will you move away from that condition? Me first, everybody else second. So. What is difficult in all this is that we cling to something so deeply that we are unwilling to let go. I've, when I studied various things, and when he's attracted to a particular thing, particular psychological, um, you know, something or other. And one goes into it, studies it, and fights about you, there is a great deal in it, and sticks to it. And then comes here and listens and adds what he has heard to that. Then it becomes a melange, a mixture of everything. Right? Aren't we doing that? So our minds become very confused. And in the, for the time being, when you are in the tent, that confusion is somewhat pushed away or in l less. And when you leave, it's back there again. So can one be aware of this con confusion, not only while you are here, but when you are home, when you are at home, which is much more important than being clear here. Nobody cares if you are or you are not. But when you go back home to face all that business, going to the office every day for the rest of your life. You understand what it all means? Day after day, day after day.
coming home, children, the worry, and all that goes on. So what does it all indicate? We have the intelligence to solve technological problems. The mind, the problem-solving mind, we all have it. And that is not intelligence. the capacity to think clearly, objectively, and know the limitation of thinking, to know, to be aware of the limitation of thinking is the beginning of intelligence. I wonder if you follow. We worship thinking. The more cleverly we can think, the greater we seem to be. All the philosophers who spin a lot of theories, but whereas if we could observe our own confusion, our own individual, narrow way of looking at life, at home, not here, to be aware of all that, and to see how thought is perpetually creating problems. Thought creates the image, and uh, that image divides. To see that is intelligence. To see danger is intelligence. To see psychological dangers is intelligence. But apparently we don't see those things. That means somebody has to goad you all the time, persuade you, push you, drive you, ask you, beg you, ex do something or other all the time to make one aware of oneself and move from there, not just stay there. And I'm afraid there is nobody who is going to do that, even the most enlightened human being. then you become his slave. You understand? So if one has the vitality, physical vitality, the psychological energy which is now being dissipated in conflict, in worry, in chattering, in endless gossip, you know, not only with others, with oneself, this endless chattering, all that it dissipates energy, the psychological energy, and that energy is needed to observe, <coughs> to observe ourselves in the mirror of relationship. And we're all related to somebody or other. And to observe there and discover the illusions, the images, the absurdity, the idiocies, then out of that freedom comes intelligence which will show the way of our life. Right? Are we moving together? Is suffering necessary to make us face the necessity to change. 
is suffering necessary to make us face the necessity to change? This is a, one of our traditions that says you must suffer in order to be good. In the Christian world and in the Hindu world they try and put different words for it, karma and so on, so on, so on. And the Buddha, everywhere they say, you must go through suffering. Which is not only physical suffering, but also psychologically. That is, you must strive, you must make an effort, you must uh, sacrifice, you must give up, you must abandon, you must uh, suppress. You know, that is our tradition, both in the East and the West. And suffering, being common to all mankind, one says, you must go through that particular door. Someone comes along, like a speaker, and says, suffering must end. Not go through it, it must end. Do you understand what I'm saying? Suffering is not necessary. It's the most destructive element in life. Like pleasure, suffering is made personal, secretive, mine, not yours. There is only there is not only global suffering. Mankind has been through enormous sorrows, wars, starvations, violence. You follow? He's faced violence in different forms and suffering in different forms. And so he accepts it as inevitable and uses that as a means to become noble or change himself. We are saying on the contrary. You may reject it, question it, doubt it, but let's find out. That is, let us seek the right answer to this. Together, not because the speaker says so. Can sorrow end? Sorrow being our grief. So many, many ways we suffer. An insult, a look. A gesture, a wound that we have received from childhood, a wound that's very deep, of which you may be conscious or unconscious, the suffering of another, the loss of another. And if you examine it closely, taking one exa one fact, which is that we are wounded from childhood by the parents, by the teachers, by other boys, girls, this is happening all the time. And this wound is deep, covered up, and one builds a wall around oneself, not to be hurt. 
And so that very wall creates fear. I don't know if you're following all this. And one asks, can this hurt? Can it go, can it be wiped away completely so that it leaves no scar? Please, we are to going over together, you understand? I'm sure you have been hurt, haven't you? All of you. Some way or another, it's there. And we carry it throughout our life. The consequences of that is that we become more and more isolated. more and more apprehensive. We don't want to be hurt anymore. So we build a wall around ourselves. And gradually withdrawal, isolation takes place. You know all this. So one asks, is it possible not to be hurt. Not only not to be hurt in the future, today, but also to wipe out the hurt that one has had from childhood. You understand? Know, we are thinking this together, please. Is it possible to wipe away the wound? the hurt that one carries about with one's uh, carries about all the time. If one is serious and if one is one should discover for oneself the cause of the hurt and what is hurt and who is hurt. You're following all this? Please. Hmm? Which means, is it possible not to register the insult, the flattery, the gesture that cuts you down, the look of annoyance, anger, the impatience, not to register any of that. This is really, do you want to go into it deeply? Shall we go into it deeply? The brain is instrument of registration, right? Like a computer, it registers. It registers because in that registration it finds security, safety. It is a form of protecting itself. Right? You are following this? Right, sir? And when one is called an idiot or some other insult takes place, the immediate reaction is to register it. Verbally, the word giving, the word has its significance, wanting to hurt, and it is registered. Like flattery, it is also registered. Right? Now, can this 
registrating process come to an end. Bearing in mind that the mind, the brain, must register. Otherwise you wouldn't know your, where your house is. You wouldn't be able to drive your car or use any language. But not to register any psychological reactions. You understand? You're following all this? Then one will ask, how? How will I prevent registration of an insult or a flattery? Flattery is m more pleasant. And therefore I like to register. But the insult, the damn or the hurt, I want to get rid of. But both factors, insult, flat, are registered. Now, is it possible not to register? Psychologically. Right? Can we go on with this? Huh? What is it that gets hurt? You say, I'm hurt. What is that entity that gets hurt? Is it an actuality? You understand what I mean? Something concrete, something tactical, something that you can uh, talk, you know, or is it something that you have created for yourself about yourself? You're following all this? I don't know. So. All right. I have an image about myself. Most of us have. That image has been created from childhood. You must be like your brother, who is so clever. You must be better. You must be good. This image is gradually being built through education, through relationship, and so on, so on. That image is me. I wonder if you accept that. That image, which is me, gets hurt. Right? Are you following? So as long as I have an image, it's going to be trodden on. By everybody. Not only by the top intellectuals, but by anybody. So is it possible to prevent the formation of images? Go into it, sir. Come with me, will you? You understand the image making machinery. What is this machinery that makes the images? You understand the images about my country, about the politicians, about the priests, about God, about you follow the whole fabrication of images. Who makes these images? And why are images made? You understand? Who makes it and why are they made? We can see very easily why they are made. For security.
for reasons of self-protection. Well, if I call myself a, a, a communist, a non-communist world, I would have a rather difficult time. Or in a communist world, if I'm not a communist, I'd be, I'd be terrible things might happen. So identifying myself with an image gives one a great security. That's the cause, that's the reason why all of us, in some form or another, have images. And who creates this image? What is the machinery? You understand? What is the process of it? Please think it out with me. Don't wait for me to tell. Will there be? Please listen to. It. Will there be, will the machinery come to an end when there is complete attention? Or the machinery is set going when there is no attention? You follow the question? You follow this, sir? Where am I to look? <laughs> when I pay complete attention, when there is complete attention, when you call me an idiot, are you doing? You call me an idiot. And the verbal tone has an impact. And the response is, you're also. <laughs> now, can I receive that word, the meaning of that word, the insult that you want me to feel <coughs> by using that word, can I be attentive of all that instantly? You understand what I'm saying? You, are, you, are you following each other? Can I be aware or attentive completely when you use that word? And you are using that word to hurt me. And to be completely attentive at that moment. It's not a sh shield. It's not something you put up in order to avoid. In that attention, there is no reception. I wonder if you see it. Whereas if, when you call me an idiot and I am inattentive, not paying attention, then registration takes place. You can experiment with this. Do it now, of God's sake, so that Not only the past wounds, past hurts, but also your mind then is so sensitive, vulnerable, it cannot be, it cannot, it is so moving, living, active, it has no moment of static moment where you can hurt. I wonder if you follow this. No, all right.
My problem is I have a ten-foot wall around me. It's no use trying to overcome it, so I ignore it. It is still there. What do I do? What's your height of the wall you have around you? This is a Is it possible to be vulnerable, to be so sensitive, to be alive, in fact, that you need never build a wall? There are walls around a property. Listen carefully. There are walls around a property. And you treat yourself as a property and so build a wall around you. You understand what I'm saying? Again, sirs, why do we do all these kind of things? Why do we build a wall and then try to tear it down and not being able to break it down, we avoid it, we run away from it, we hide behind it. Why do we do all these things? Why do we create problems for ourselves? Why can't we be so sane, normal, healthy? Not normal, sorry. <laughs> now, this is a problem to the question. What is a problem? Take your. You have a problem, hmm? right? Haven't you? No? Oh my God. <laughs> what is your what is the problem? Something that you have not been able to resolve. Right? You have analyzed it, you have been to a psychiatrist, you have been to a confession, if you have or you have analysed yourself, hmm? and the problem remains. The cause remains, and you have examined the effects, analysed the effects, right? And the peculiarity of a cause is the cause becomes the effect. You follow what I'm saying? And the effect becomes the cause. I wonder if you understand all this. Is this too intellectual? No, all right. So what is a problem for all of us? What is our problem? And why do we have problems? You want one problem is, let's take a common problem, does God exist? Hmm? I'm taking that as a silly example. <coughs> because we say, by, if God exists, how can he create this monstrous world? Right? So I, it becomes more and more and more of a problem. First of all, I assume God has created it, this world, and then I get involved in it. Or I have a certain ideal, I want to live up to that ideal. That becomes a problem. I don't see 
why you should have ideals at all. First I create an ideal, then I try to live up to it, then all the problem arises. Struggle, I'm not good, I must be good, uh, tell me what to do uh, to achieve my... and so on, so on. You follow the... how we create a problem, create something illusory first, like non-violence is illusory. The fact is violence. And then my problem arises, how am I to be non-violent? <laughs> Whereas I am violent, let me deal with that, not with non-violence. I wonder if you get this. So is this what we are doing at one level? Or I cannot get on with my wife. <laughs> I'm rather nervous about this. <laughs> <coughs> I cannot get on with somebody or other. So we make up you follow what I'm trying to we make problems of out of every thing. Now the question is much more important than resolution of problems, is not to have problems at all. <coughs> so that your mind is free from this everlasting struggle to resolve something. What is the core of the of all problems? Not technological problems, it's not mathematical problems, but the human deep inward psychological problem. What is the root of it? Come on, sir. <laughs> um, Is there a root that can be pulled out or withered away that, so that the mind is, has no problems whatsoever? Go on, so let's... Hmm? What is a problem? Something to be resolved in the present or in the future, right? Problem only exists in time. Are we get it? You understand what I'm saying? So please tell me. Huh? You understand this, my question? Problem exists as long as we are thinking in terms of time. Not only chronological time, but inward, psychological time. As long as I have not understood the nature of psychological time, I must have problems. You understand? Are you meeting? We are moving together. That is, I want to be successful in the worldly sense, or also I want to be spiritually successful. They are both the same. Now, wanting to be successful is a movement in time. Right? You follow this? And that creates the problem. 
that is wanting to be something is time, and that wanting to be is the problem. Concrete or not? Right? So I'm saying, what is the root of this that creates problems, problems, problems? Not only time, hmm? but go on, say, investigate with me. <laughs> is it thought? Or is there this centre which is always moving within its own radius? Do you understand what I'm saying? Won't problems exist as long as I am concerned about myself? As long as I am wanting to be good, wanting to be this, wanting to be that, and so on and so on. I must create problems, which means, can I live without a single image about myself? Do you understand? As long as I have an image to be successful, to I must achieve enlightenment, I must reach God, I must be good, I must be more loving, mm? I mustn't be greedy, I mustn't hurt, I must live peacefully, I must have a quiet mind, I must know what meditation is. Mm? You follow? Is it possible to love so freely? And so on. You follow? That is, as long as there is, a centre, there must be problems. Now, that centre is the essence of inattention. Are you getting it? Oh, come on with me. When there is attention, there is no centre. I wonder if you meet this, right? Now look, when you listen, if you are listening, when you listen to what is being said and attending, not trying to understand what you say, attending, in that attention there is no you. you n the moment there is no attention, the you creeps up. And that centre creates the problems. Got it? No, sir, this is very, very serious if you go into it. To have a mind that has no problems. And therefore, no experience. Moment you have an experience, <coughs> and hold on to it, then it becomes memory and you want more of it. <coughs> so a mind that has no problem, has no experience. Oh, you don't see the beauty of it. I derive strength from concentrating on a symbol. I belong to a group that encourages this. Is this an illusion? May I respectfully point out, don't belong to anything. Right? But you can't help it, you do. So see the reason of this. We cannot stand alone. 
we want support, we want the strength of others, we want to be identified with a group, with an organization. The foundation is not an, such an organization, it merely exists to publish books and so on. Though you can't belong to it because you can't publish books, you can't run schools. But the idea that we must be part of something or other, right? And belonging some belonging to something gives one strength right i'm an englishman because immediately there is a flutter or a frenchman once i was talking in india and i said i'm not a hindu and a man came up to me afterwards, he means you're not a Hindu? You must feel terribly lonely. <laughs> now, the questioner says, asks, he derives strength from concentrating on a symbol. We all have symbols. Christian world is filled with symbols. Right? Right? The whole Christian world of religious movement is symbols. Symbols, images, concepts, beliefs, ideals, dogmas, rituals, same in India, only they don't call themselves Christians, but it's exactly the same thing, or in the Far East and so on. Now, when one belongs to a large group which adores the same symbol, you derive enormous strength out of it. It's natural, or rather unnatural. It keeps you excited. Hmm? It, would, it creates a feeling that at last you are understanding something beyond the symbol, and so on. First, you invent the symbol. See the, how our mind works. First, we invent the symbol, the image in the church or in the temple or the letters in the mosque. They are beautiful letters if you've been in a mosque. And we create those, and after creating those, we worship those, and in worshipping that which we have created out of our awe, we derive strength. <laughs> see, the, see what is happening to our... You follow? Now, the symbol is not the actual, right? The actual may never exist, but the symbol satisfies. And the symbol gives us vitality, energy, by looking, thinking, observing, being with it. Surely, that which has been created by thought, hmm, psychologically, must be illusion. No? You create me, I'm, I hope you won't, you create me into your guru. I refuse to be a guru, it's too absurd. Because I see, 
how the followers destroy the Guru and the Guru destroys the followers. You understand this? I see that. I don't want. Uh, to me, the whole thing is an ab- abomination. I'm sorry to use long, strong language. But you create an image about me, about the speaker, and the whole business begins. So, if I may point out, thought is the mischief maker in this. All the things in the churches, in the temples, in the mosques are not truth, are not actual. They have been invented by the priests, by thought, by by us, out of our fear, out of our anxiety, uncertainty of the future, and you follow all that. We have created a symbol and we are caught in that. So first to realise that thought will always create the things it, it the things which give us it satisfaction psychologically. Pleasure, you follow? Gives it comfort. Therefore the the uh, reassuring image is great comfort. It may be a total illusion, and it is, but it gives me comfort. Therefore, I will never look beyond the illusion. Right? Now we've talked an hour and twenty-five minutes. We'll continue with the rest of the questions on Thursday. Is that all right?